Hello, in this podcast we're looking at biomass power and battery power. And alluring targets are to describe and give the advantages and disadvantages for biomass fuel, hydrogen fuel cells, and fuel cells in general. We'll start with biomass. Biomass are made up of plant materials. Usually it's wood or agricultural waste and animal wastes that can be burned directly or converted into gaseous and liquid biofuels. Usually this is used for heating and cooking but it can also be used for electricity and industry. Biomass provides 10% of the world's energy and it's used proportionally more the less developed and poorer a country gets. It's 35% of the energy in developing countries and 95% in the poorest countries. St. Paul, Minnesota is a very good example of biomass in the developed world. What they do is they take wood chips from a recycling center and also urban waste and all of that provides heat and also 25 megawatts of electricity for downtown. It's reduced its reliance on coal by 70 percent. Since all the wood is recycled and nothing is chopped down for that, all of this heat and all of this electricity is carbon neutral. Now, biomass itself is renewable just so long as its use is less than replenishment. There is pollution from biomass because when the wood is burned incompletely it releases particulates, mostly ash and soot, carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons. And if someone is living in a place where it's possible to get inversion layers, that will trap those pollutants. And unfortunately, some of the hydrocarbons are carcinogenic, meaning that they cause cancer. Now, there are wood stoves that burn efficiently and cleanly because these pollutants mainly occur when wood is burned incompletely. But these wood stoves are also expensive. Some methods for burning efficiently are to run exhaust gases through heat exchangers that will capture the heat one problem with it is that the temperatures get too low, flammable deposits will build up in those areas. Using Brookline fireboxes with afterburner chambers and that will burn up the hydrocarbons. The catalytic converters, just like the ones that are in your car, can remove the pollutants. The one thing about it is that the people have to go out and chop down their own in rural areas. Because populations are increasing, they're chopping down more of the firewood and they're using it unsustainably so that we have to go further and further to get wood for fuel. So it's requiring women and children to spend much more time searching for food. Now in cities, there's really nothing around for them to use for fuel because it's already been chopped down. So they have to buy it and it's expensive. It can be many times the price that fuel would be out in the country. However, many places such as Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and several other countries they only use dead wood, so the harvest is sustainable. Anything that's dead and down can be used. All the living wood is left alone. But where fuel is rare, the deforestation becomes a major problem. Examples of that would be Haiti, where 90% of the forests are gone. And if you look at the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic on Google Earth, in quite a few places, you can see the border between the two countries because on one side of the border, the area is forested and the other side it is not. Sudan and Rwanda's harvest of the wood is 10 times the sustainable yield. Now we come to animal biomass and this mostly is burning manure. Unfortunately most of the nutrients are lost in the burning so that can lead to food shortages because the manure otherwise would have been used to fertilize the fields. Another way to make use of the biomass is to get the methane that is produced by the bacteria in the manure. The way this is done is by placing the manure in a warm and wet place and that will produce the methane. And that provides more heat than burning the manure and what you're left with still makes an excellent fertilizer. So that basically will give you a greater advantage of having a more efficient way of producing heat by using methane and you don't lose the fertilization so that will not cause food shortages. Also it reduces the climate change because Methane is about a hundred times stronger a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And in many places, like what you see in the next bullet, like landfills, sewage treatment plants, manure from farms, those are all producing methane on their own. And if we weren't capturing that methane and burning it, that methane would go into the atmosphere and would cause climate change. Now we come to the advantages and disadvantages to biomass. Advantages are that some areas have abundant supplies. It has a moderate cost to it. And if it's used sustainably, there's no carbon increase because at the very least, for every bit of wood that you take is replaced by new wood being grown. 
Also, the crops for biomass can be planted on land that's too arid for crops, and these biomass crops can also help restore the degraded land, for one thing, by preventing erosion. You can use biomass waste products, such as waste from agriculture, timber, and urban wastes. Examples of the waste for agriculture would be the parts of the plant that are not used for food. Urban waste could be things like, like tree limbs that are cut down so that they don't bring down the power lines during a storm. Disadvantages. When biomass is used unsustainably, then the renewable resource becomes a non-renewable resource. It also has a moderate to high environmental impact. That's due to not burning it completely. The environmental costs are not included in the market price, and we've seen this again and again and again, and so keep this in mind that if you are ever asked on a free response question, a disadvantage for any type of fuel, if you talk about the environmental cost not being included in the market price, then you should be okay with that. Just make sure you don't simply say environmental costs are not included in the market price. Explain why it's not included. Another disadvantage is that this can cause soil erosion, water pollution, and habitat loss. And just to expand that a little bit, habitat loss would be that the the area that, you, that the crops that are used for biomass are planted, that reduces the habitat for things that naturally grow there. Also, it can compete for cropland. This can be problems particularly in poorer areas where the big landowners maybe realize that they can make more money from growing things for biomass rather than growing things for food, so they choose the biomass. And as I said before, inefficient wood stoves and open fires pollute. Liquid biofuels. These can be used to replace petroleum fuels, and they can be grown anywhere, so there is no country that's like Saudi Arabia, where Saudi Arabia contains a lot of the oil, so very few, and it's not all that populated, so very few people get rich on selling oil to most of the world, which does not have a lot of oil. Like the unconverted biofuels, it's a renewable resource if it's not overused. Also, these can be used now. It's easy to store and transport through existing networks, which are used for fossil fuels. And today's cars can use them usually without any modification at all. But there are environmental costs. There's habitat loss, and the fertilizers that are used to grow the crops release nitric oxide, and it's a greenhouse gas that's 300 times stronger than carbon dioxide. One example of liquid biofuel is biodiesel, and this is made from vegetable oil, and it can be used oil. Uh, you just have to clean it up a bit. And by used oil, I would mean that you can go to, say, a fast food restaurant and ask them for the waste oil that they've been using to cook the food, and you can make your biodiesel from that after cleaning it up. This is a video on how biodiesel can be made at home. But keep in mind that, uh, as they say in the video, materials that are used to make it are extremely dangerous, so, yeah, so people who make it have to be very, very careful. Biodiesel is a non-petroleum-based diesel fuel consisting of short-chain alkyl esters made by, and this is a big word, transesterification of vegetable oil, which can be used alone or blended with conventional petrodiesel in unmodified diesel engine vehicles. So join me as we make some homemade biodiesel on today's weekend project. You'll find the biodiesel project in Make Volume 3 and it's on page 68. But before we get started, keep in mind that while biodiesel is safe to handle and store, the home brewing process that we're about to do involves flammable, poisonous, and caustic chemicals, alcohols, and lye. Sounds fun, doesn't it? So wear your safety glasses and nitrile gloves with plenty of ventilation. All right, let's get started. There are a number of materials and supplies you'll need to make your own biodiesel. Uh, we won't describe each and every one, but we will as we go through the process of making it. Our first and most dangerous ingredient is 100% lye that can be found in drain opener, and that's sodium hydroxide, and we're going to measure out about 5 grams, and carefully add that to a standard mason jar. Our next ingredient is methanol, which can be found in the name brand Heat, which is available in most auto parts stores. Measure out 220 milliliters of the heat. Then carefully add the heat to the lye. Seal the top tightly and begin swirling it until the lye is dissolved. And this mixture is our meth oxide solution, which is very dangerous, so be careful. 
I'll be using brand new vegetable oil, which is cholesterol free, by the way, and we'll measure out one liter of oil, and we need to heat it up. So we'll get our little stove, pour our oil in a pot, add our thermometer, and heat it up to about 130 degrees. Carefully add the hot oil to a two liter glass or plastic bottle. Then pour in the meth oxide solution, seal the top, and begin shaking. You have to shake pretty hard for about five minutes. Set this mixture aside, and in about a half hour or so, you'll see some color change take place. And you should start to see a darker layer at the bottom. This is our glycerin, and our biodiesel is the lighter color on the top. Now you need to let this mixture sit overnight, and the next day you'll see a dramatic change in the color. Now it's time to pour the biodiesel layer off the top into another bottle, and we don't want to pour any of the glycerin in there, just the biodiesel. Okay, it's time to wash and dry the biodiesel. And this is done by adding some warm distilled water to our biodiesel and slowly mixing the two together. The idea here is to separate the soap that's naturally in the biodiesel from the biodiesel fuel. Once you see a little bit of the white soapiness begin to form, it's time to flip the bottle over carefully and slowly drain out the soap. You may have to repeat this procedure two or three times or maybe even more to thoroughly clean your biodiesel. Then it's time to let it sit and dry in open air. Okay, we've let our new batch of biodiesel sit for a few hours, but it really needs a couple of days to completely evaporate, and then it'll be ready to put in a diesel engine. And you might want to filter it through some coffee filters just to remove any small microabrasives that may still be present. But generally, it's going to work just fine in small quantities. Well, there's how to cook your very own homemade biodiesel. The advantages to biodiesel are that it reduces carbon dioxide emissions and the way it does that is because all of the carbon in it have come from plants and that's and not from fossil fuels so the, the carbon and fossil fuels have been in the ground for hundreds of millions of years so that's adding carbon the carbon that's in plants have been going through the carbon cycle so it's not so there's no net increase when it's added there's several types of sources of biodiesel. One of them is palm oil, and palm oil has a high net energy. Rapeseed oil, and more commonly in the supermarket, it's called canola oil, that has a moderate net energy. Burning it reduces hydrocarbon emissions, particularly when compared to solid biofuel. It gives a better gas mileage, and it is potentially renewable. Diesel cars can use biodiesel without being converted. Unlike diesel cars which run on vegetable oil, those have to be converted in order to do that. Disadvantages. There is increased air pollution, mostly nitric oxides and smog. It is more expensive than fossil fuel diesel. The materials that are used to make it are more expensive than it is to refine oil. And like everything else, the environmental costs are not included in the price. If the biodiesel fuel comes from soybeans, which is what most biodiesel in the United States is, that is a low net energy. And these may compete with food crops and raise food prices. The way there's competition with food crops is, you see that right in the line above, soybean is not primarily used to make biodiesel. It, soybean is used for foods and it is also used for medicines and many, many other things. So when we start using a lot for biodiesel, then there's, less, then there's less soybean to use for food, and that's going to drive up the prices of soybean. Also, biodiesels can make engines hard to start in cold weather. Ethanol is another liquid biofuel, and it is produced through fermentation of sugars in such plants as sugarcane, corn, switchgrass, or just simply plant waste. If the mixture contains 10 to 23 percent of ethanol and the rest is gasoline, it's called gasohol, and all cars can burn it. There is a special kind of car called flexible fuel cars, and they can burn a fuel called E85, and that's 85% ethanol and 50% gasoline. Largest producers of ethanol in the United States and Brazil. Brazil gets their ethanol mostly from sugarcane, but and by doing that, it saved their 10 times their investment in ethanol compared to what they would have been buying otherwise by oil. And the sugarcane that's used for the ethanol is used on 1% of the land that is used for farms. So it's been very, very useful for Brazil. In the United States, the ethanol comes from corn. A lot of the profit for the farmers come from government subsidies. 
but the environmental benefits are questionable because the fossil fuels are burned to plant, grow, and harvest the corn so that there actually may end there may be more of a carbon cost to ethanol from corn than there is by burning fossil fuels. And also it has raised fuel prices since many, many foods in the United States contain corn as an ingredient. For example, the main sweetener in many foods and drinks, like just about every single soda that you buy, contains high fructose corn syrup, and high fructose corn syrup comes from corn. Here are the advantages and disadvantages for ethanol. The advantage is that it's high octane. When sugarcane is used, that reduces the carbon dioxide emissions. For sugarcane, there's a high net energy yield. That's why it's so good in Brazil. And there are reduced carbon monoxide emissions. Ethanol is potentially renewable because it comes from plants, and if it's used at the right amounts, then whatever is used can easily be grown and replaced. Disadvantages is that there's a lower driving range for ethanol than gasoline. If corn is used, there is both a low net energy yield and higher carbon dioxide emissions. It is expensive. Ethanol is not normally found in plants, so it has to be converted chemically, and that is expensive. The environmental costs are not included in the market price. As I said before, it may compete with food crops and raise the prices. There are higher nitric oxide emissions in smog. It is corrosive, and it can make engines hard to start in the winter. Now we come to fuel cells. Fuel cells are just like a battery in the sense that both batteries and fuel cells use a chemical reaction to produce the energy. Example of chemical reaction producing energy, which is simply if you light a Mac, the energy that's in the bonds in the wood are being released through an oxidation reaction. The difference between the battery and the fuel cell is that when a battery runs down, either you dispose of it, or if it's rechargeable, you, you plug it into the wall and you start recharging it. Fuel cell, you don't recharge it, what you do is you add more fuel. A fuel cell is a device that takes uh, stored chemical energy and converts it into electrical energy directly. Essentially it takes the chemical energy that's stored within whatever fuel you have, it could be hydrogen, it could be methane, it could be gasoline, and then through uh, two electrochemical reactions it converts that directly into electricity. The major components of the fuel cell are the electrolyte, which is also a, a separator, so it keeps the reactants from mixing together. The next pieces are the electrodes, and these are catalysts where the electrochemical reactions occur. And then beyond that, there's a, typically a bipolar plate, or again, sometimes called a separator, but this is a way to collect the current and also build the voltage from the cells. The fuel cell runs best on hydrogen. But hydrogen is not you know, available. You can't dig up uh, hydrogen out of the ground. You can dig up a fossil fuel and convert it uh, into a hydrogen-rich stream. Uh, but to do that in a fuel cell, you need to reform it and then clean up the, uh, the gases quite a bit before you can put it in a fuel cell. There are certainly fuel cells that have been looked at uh, to take gasoline, reform it in a vehicle, convert it to a hydrogen-rich stream and run a fuel cell. Uh, but that's, it's a very complex process and most people have decided that that's not the right route to go. There are specific challenges that, that are still present. Uh, one is that the volume of the fuel cell you know, is relatively large compared to the volume of an internal combustion engine. So you've got to fit this into the vehicle and, and that's always uh, hard to do. So you've got to really work hard to either get the technology better to make the fuel cell smaller or just package it into the vehicle. So this is a typical device that we use for laboratory testing. It's a single cell, which means it contains one, one fuel cell, so it generates around 0.8 volts. And if you wanted larger voltages, you have to put them in series. That's the ionomer membrane, that's the electrolyte and the separator. And then this black here is the electrodes where the electrochemical reactions occur. And then on top of that, you just have uh, basically hardware that holds it all together so you can control these things. And this is a fully assembled version where we provide gases in and out of the cell and we have electrical connections uh, to take the power out. I think the, the, you know, the, the major drawbacks to fuel cells is, is their cost 
compared to competitors. They're providing things you're already getting today, so they have to do it either more efficiently or a lower cost, and so far they really haven't been able to crack that nut to get to the cost that's competitive with other devices. And here we see a diagram showing the way that fuel cells work. This example is a hydrogen fuel cell. The chemical reaction basically is hydrogen mixes with oxygen, and that produces water and lots and lots of energy. And just like you can stack batteries together to make more power, fuel cells also can be stacked together. There are a lot of disadvantages to fuel cells. So in many, many cases, many types of fuel cells, particularly the hydrogen fuel cell, it's not profitable to use it right now. But in the future, it may be more efficient to power cars using the hydrogen fuel cell. Phosphoric acid fuel cells, and there are other kinds besides phosphoric and hydrogen, those are profitable and they are used for stationary structures such as the police station in Central Park. Uh, they chose to use fuel cells there because it is a remote location that's off the grid being in the middle of the park and using something like solar power would be a bit more of an ice source so they decided to use fuel cells. There are advantages and disadvantages to hydrogen fuel cells. The advantages are that it's produced from water and we've got plenty of water and when it's made from water, it has a very low environmental impact because it doesn't have any emissions and the product that comes out of it is water. First, you have to split the water to get your hydrogen, and then at the end of the day when you've used it, water comes out. If you use renewable energy to split the water to produce your hydrogen, then your hydrogen fuel cells are renewable. If not, if you're using fossil fuels to provide the energy to do that, then it's not renewable. And if the hydrogen comes from water, there are no carbon dioxide emissions. This stuff is easier to store than electricity. I know when you think of things like the Hindenburg, hydrogen explosions, those are huge explosions. But actually, a hydrogen fuel cell is safer than gasoline and natural gas because gasoline and natural gas are far more explosive than hydrogen. Hydrogen fuel cells are a very high efficiency and they are non-toxic. There are disadvantages. They said before the hydrogen has to be made, you cannot find hydrogen naturally on Earth. So that takes a lot of energy, a lot of energy. The fuel cells have a negative net energy. It takes more energy to produce the hydrogen than what you get out when the hydrogen fuel cell is being used. If the hydrogen is made from fossil fuel, made from natural gas, in that case, there are carbon dioxide emissions. Environmental costs are not included in the price. This is expensive. For cars that today are, there are hydrogen cars today, but they all have a short driving range. There's also no fuel distribution in place. Like, like we have a huge fuel distribution in place for gasoline and for diesel. Every place you go, you can find a gas station. You will not find a hydrogen station. Leaking hydrogen gas can deplete the ozone layer. So, Hydrogen fuel cells are an amazing fuel, but they're the fuel of the future. It's not something that's all that feasible today. Now we come to our concluding questions. Number one, how do we get energy from biomass? Number two, identify one advantage and one disadvantage to biofuels. Number three, compare and contrast fuel cells and batteries. And number four, identify one advantage and one disadvantage to hydrogen fuel cells. That concludes this podcast, and I'll see you in class tomorrow.